Welcome to the Rebooting Business Podcast, where we discuss how businesses can reboot, rebuild, and come back bigger and stronger than ever before in a post-COVID-19 reality. And now, here's your host, David Summerfleck. And hello there, my name's David Summerfleck, and you are watching or listening to another episode of Rebooting Business. This is episode 30, and this episode of Rebooting Business is brought to you by the Digital Marketing Specialists online at www.dms.blue. Get the digital marketing solutions you need to grow your business at dms.blue. My very special guest today is Daniel Ford. Daniel, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. I appreciate it. Uh, I, David, I really appreciate you having me on. I'm, I'm really looking forward to a great conversation. You're a pretty interesting guy. And I want to start, at least to me anyway, I want to start with your, basically who you are, but your background and how you came to be very proficient or very um, experienced in cybersecurity. I'll let you decide whether or not you want to, you know, say you're an expert, because obviously I don't know that much about it. I know only about it as a web developer and, and digital marketing guy. Ah, sure. You know, I, I don't know if I'd, I'd claim to be an expert. You know, I, I believe that I know more than some and not as much as others. Uh, I, there's a lot of people that work for me, or um, really with me, that are much more talented than what I am at this point. I mean, at a certain point, I guess, in everyone's career, you know, when you become the, the, the leader and the person where the, the buck stops there, you can't also be the person that's, that's doing anymore. You have to advise and you have to get them to come to consensus. So, uh, you know, I've been fortunate that I grew up with a really good work ethic from playing sports. And, and a lot of my analogies and, and how I've put together all came from my father growing up playing baseball, I didn't realize how much I really learned. You know, I, you know, the first part was my, my dad always said, you're only as good as the next game you play. And I've put that into my the people that interned for me and my younger folks and even all the way up now at the executive leadership te um, team. And I say, you know, it doesn't matter what we did right now, because take a moment, savor it. Doesn't matter if you won or you lost. Because tomorrow, <clears throat> we have to do better. And so if we lost today, hey, tomorrow we can wake up and, and, and we can start winning again. Right. And so I never, you know, and that came from a, you know, the also as part of that aspect. And it really started to solidify when I used to read, you know, and I read Rudyard Kipling's If quite often. And in part of yeah. that, it says, if you can treat disaster and triumph as the same two imposters. Uh, and I, I really take take heart of that and that work ethic. The other thing that my dad taught me growing up was if you give 100%, 100% of the time, you will win more against those people that are talented than you because they know they're better and they'll take a playoff. So if you never take a playoff, you could, you might, that ball might bounce funny and you're safe by a split second at first base. And then you can steal second, steal third, sack fly, hey, win the game you know, or a bunt, but you will win more than when you would lose because you just didn't give up. You know, I think that's really a big part of it and that you only really fail when you choose to no longer dedicate time and resources to a particular effort. So as long as you get back up, you didn't, you didn't lose, you didn't fail. You had a setback, but you're, you're still going. So, you know, with all of that, I made some mistakes along the way in the beginning. I thought I wanted to be an accountant like mm. my, my dad and computer programmer, and I absolutely hated it. <clears throat> um, so I didn't go back to school for a little while. Uh, I went to this trade school that was really popular in the, uh, the late 90s, early 2000s called the Computer Learning Center. Um, they wound up going bankrupt, um, but I did that. Um, I was working, I was always tinkering with computers. I had a job in in uh, technology where I was handling some cute computers for a lady in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. Um, and I just really just learned it on my own and went to computer learning center, trade school, got my, you know, my MCSE and Windows NT 4.0 and 
uh, my Novell CNA and 411. So, which was, a, you know, for those that don't know, that's a server operating system back in the day. So then I got lucky. You know, I, I really, I didn't, I just, well, I say lucky. I just didn't say no for opportunities came by. I worked at XM Radio and then 9-11 happened and I worked for Homeland Security. Then I bounced around with a bunch of different government agencies. And then I decided at some point I was going to go back to school. So I worked full time, got my undergrad in computer science. And then I started working towards a master's in computer forensics at George Washington. And then a master's at um, Capital Tech University. Uh, and information assurance management, and then a doctor in science and uh, computer science, cybersecurity from there. Um, you know, those that don't know, Capital Tech was the first university or one of the first to get certified by the National Security Agency in computer security, cybersecurity. Uh, and then I just finished with my MBA from University of Michigan uh, this past May. Um, got to develop some technologies for the government, uh, develop you know, an Android phone called Black Phone. Then I decided to get into financial mm -hmm. services. So I've been all over the map. Um, you know, I'm now the chief information officer for you know, Jovia Financial out in Long Island. Um, we're, you know, a little, like about three and a half billion dollar credit union, which is a very large credit union. Um, it's a little bit different than government. Uh, I, I like to joke and say, you know, we're just, uh, you know, you know, if you ever saw the the movie office space where they're trying to take a little bit of money, fractions of the dollar. Well, you know, that's just, that's legal now. We do that in financial institutions, but some of these round up apps that you'll see, they're like, hey, if you round up the, the nearest dollar, you can either put it in a savings account or to donate. Well, the financial institutions, like, you know, we just made that legal. We took that idea from office space and made it legal. I like to say, hey, now we're just, you know, <laughs> we're legal gangsters at this point. <laughs> So let me ask you, I think that's an incredible, um, you know, uh, education that you have. Um, now, you're also a technology mentor, right? Absolutely. I, I absolutely believe in mentoring and being mentored. I still have um, mentors to myself that uh, where I mentee, you know, often I meet, I, I talk with them, you know, at least weekly in a lot of ways. And, and I've, uh, had the had the pleasure of a lot of uh, young talent working for me. I, I believe that if you you know to be the best at whatever you want to do, and the research is pretty clear, um, be a lifelong teacher, because when you try to teach people things, you retain the up to ninety percent of that knowledge. Whereas right. if you're just a lifelong learner, it's something like sixty percent. So I want that additional thirty percent. So I always want people that are working with me that I can teach. And whether it be interns, younger talent, I, I wanna take that time to constantly groom people to be the best that they can be for whatever the direction of their career is. So as a technology mentor, how does that work? I mean, do you sit down with someone who's a business owner and say, this is what you need to, to consider to work more efficiently? Or how exactly does that work? I'm just curious. Yeah, so from when I do it from the on the side where I'm looking at it for the entire organization, I mean, the first part of it is to understand what their business goals are. It's yeah. really, you know, it's really hard for a technology person to do that. We use the wrong terms all the time. You know, we'll say we'll say, you know, you've got technical debt. And to a business owner, debt is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, so when right. we say debt, they're like, well, why is that bad? Is, what's the, is the cost of equity greater or less than the cost of debt? And, and it, they don't understand it. So what they understand are terms like CapEx and OpEx. So the first thing is, is and, and, I, and I, this is why I, one of my mentors, Gopi Menon, he was uh, the former CIO of where I used to work for. He really convinced me to do my MBA. Uh, and, and it really helped me to put technology terms and business relatable uh, examples. So when I talk to that business owner, when I talk to the board of directors, I can get what their business objectives are and then show how technology can assist because it's just a tool. That, that's, that's all it really is. Uh, and then we can determine whether or not the best things are, like you'll hear all the time, people saying, oh, let's move to the cloud or, oh, we have to stay on premise. Well, what does in the cloud mean? And it means different things to different people. Uh, and 
<clears throat> you know, some people are going to say, oh, it's secure. Others are like, no, it's not secure. So what's the answer? Well, what I learned, which is the number one answer to everything, I used to think the answer was 42. Well, I've actually learned after doing my MBA, the answer is it depends. So <laughs> that is yeah. the... <laughs> it does, because you know you don't know what unique um, situation they're in, what they're bringing to the equation, what they're working with. You, you don't know. Um, so let me ask you, because there's so many things to touch on here. What is the current temperature, for lack of a better word, of cybersecurity in the U.S. compared to other major industrialized uh, countries? How does the U.S., for example, compare in terms of online and computer security, because it's two different things, to the U.K. or Canada or Japan or even Russia? Uh, well, so you, the... A lot of the, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it from the uh, how the United States classifies um, their allies, which they refer to it as like the five the five eyes. So you have yeah, the United I've heard States, that. I've heard that. right? So you have the United States, you know, uh, Canada, the UK, New Zealand, Australia. So from that perspective, we are all pretty closely aligned with how we treat uh, cybersecurity, especially from the federal government perspective or the DSD, which is um, in, in Australia and New Zealand, they may even call it the same thing. It's the Ministry of Defense in, um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so we all pretty much have the same things. We just kind of call them different. There'll right. be different regulations, but they all really relate to the same thing. So we're all pretty on par there. Where things start to get a little bit tricky in my my perspective and opinion is when you start going down into the next tiers of allies of convenience. So, I, and, I, and I, this is my terms, not necessarily, you know, speaking on behalf of whatever the government might say. Uh, thankfully, I don't work for the government anymore. But I, I don't classify Israel or China um, or other countries like, you know, in South America possibly as just an ally. They're an ally of convenience. So with Israel, mm. yes, they're an ally, you know, militarily while we're in the Middle East, but I don't necessarily believe that they are economically. And the reason I say that is when we take a look at the history of intellectual property theft in the United States and around the world, you know, at one point in time, Israel's economic and state-sponsored espionage programs were tied together, or at least that's what the rumors were. But the United States has this organization called the National Counterintelligence Executive, where at one time every year they reported to Congress as to where what countries were responsible for intellectual property theft of the United States and some, if they could figure it out around the world with our allies. Israel used to be number one, and China was number two. Now China is number one, and I think Israel is number two. The reports haven't been put out there for a while, um, but... That's also because the laws in other parts of the world are much different when it comes to intellectual property, which is how when we talk about, you know, commercial companies, you know, for profit companies, intellectual property plays a huge role. So the United States, you know, my, 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 someone could certainly fact check me and at me if I'm wrong. Um, the United States is a first to prove country, meaning the first to prove that you invented this. The invention is yours where in many other parts of the world, it's the first to file. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that, that, that's a huge difference. So if I'm in another part of the world, because the United States will recognize intellectual property, sovereignty rights of other countries. So if it was that granted there, we're likely to grant it here. So these other countries would, it's in their best interest because they're smaller economically in order to be able to compete with U.S. companies in the United States as a whole. They're, they had a whole operations on stealing the local property and let's get it first to file in the EU and, and in Asia because in the United States with, through reciprocity would, would do that. So um, the United States was thinking about changing those laws as well. Uh, you know, I, I don't know which is better. My, uh, ec my professor at George Washington uh, was very adamant that he believes it should be the first to prove, not the first to file. And he would go to the EU and around the world and really lobby for those aspects because, you know, putting it down on paper doesn't necessarily mean 
it's a, a, you know, it's applicable or you can actually do this. Right. Uh, it leaves open too much for interpretation. To prove, you got to have like a proof of concept and you're trying to get it out there. So, you know, that that just spurred a lot of what I believe um, cyber crime because now these these other parts of the world it's also not necessarily illegal in those countries to commit cyber crime when you're outside of it. So if I'm in one country and I'm attacking a United States company, I, I won't have to worry about going to jail. So it really makes it difficult for you know people in the in the cybersecurity community where they're trying to play defense to account for that. Uh, so not that it's impossible, but that's just kind of how I look at it. Um, Russia, you know, I, I don't know enough about what, you know, in terms of, I, it would only be anecdotal as to how mm. they really look at things. I mean, they definitely have a, a very good state sponsored program and state sponsored doesn't, you don't have to be a big country to be really good. That's the, that's the unique part about being a, having we'll say cyber operations the the offensive as a part you know or what other people might refer to as cyber warfare having those kind of capabilities you don't need to be a big country you just no, it's organized know, yeah organized and you know go take some lessons that you know everywhere around the world basically has so is the u.s still at the top or were we ever you know it's a yeah, my, my ego would like to say that, yeah, of course, right? I'm American. I want to have that pride. Uh, I, I don't know if it matters, to be honest. Um, the When it comes to cyber warfare, I, I really believe that uh, everyone has the only, the only difference would be the amount of people that could be doing something. So, you know, a denial of service attack. If I've got a million people that are all trained in doing denial of service, Versus 50, well, I can cause more, I can, I can make it more challenging. I guess what I'm trying to get at is when you read about election rigging with 2016, I'm not, and, and I don't know um, the extent, but when we look at uh, the elections, when we look at cybersecurity in the U.S., how 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 safe is that in the U.S.? I mean, how safe are our elections really? Because if you look at the election, the voting machines physically they look really really easy to have. They look very fragile. They don't really seem to have much there. Are our elections easy to hack? And I know I'm asking this in a very roundabout way. Are our elections secure, especially with the 2020 election coming up? And not to say even touch on the whole postal service uh, issue going on. I, I So safe, of course, is, is a relative term. Right. You know, so... I would I would change it maybe in terms of what's the probability of malicious actors being able to compromise the physical voting machines. Uh, I think that would require a state-sponsored level, uh, right, it, right aspect, because they would you know one they'd have to get into the the voting machines. So these I don't believe these voting machines are are necessarily connected to the internet. They seem to me, at least, and I, and I don't know enough about it, but if, if I were looking at it from my attack surface, so, you know, um, what, what you know, an attack surface is essentially like, look, as we're human bodies, I know if I take, you know, X amount of pounds of pressure to my knee, it's going to blow out, right? So, you know, I, I want to make sure I protect my knees, things like that. So that's kind of, hey, I know I'm vulnerable. So your attack surface is kind of like what you're vulnerable to. So, you know, I would be looking at what, type of physical integrity are the voting systems um, put in place. And since we are made up as a republic of states, each state should know every physical component that is in that device. And you can see that by running a diagnostics. And you run that diagnostics um, at 
intervals um, to determine whether or not hardware has changed. If hardware has changed, it becomes now long, it's been compromised. Because I remember, and, I'm, and, and I don't have an agenda, I'm just asking you because I, I, you know more about this than I do, so I want to know. I remember volunteering for, um, I, I won't get involved in politics, but I remember volunteering several years ago. And I remember they would put in the voting machines. There was no real background check to speak of. Anybody could volunteer. Anybody could go and handle the actual machines and set the machines up and move them and take them anywhere you wanted to. And I think there was a space, space for a flash drive. There, there probably is. And, and, and probably... nobody monitored me. Nobody cared whether I was coming or going. I could take the a chalk full of voting machines and pull behind some building or something and nobody would know or care and probably do it for a good hour or two before anybody would ask anything. So what's your take on all that? Right. I mean, and that's why with those physical voting machines, one, I, I mean, I think the way we do voting is, is, is archaic at this point. Yeah. Other countries have proven that you can utilize technology and, and, and do this. I mean, India most recently with some things. So, I mean, what I would be doing is, is the, you know, as a state board of electors, they should be having someone physically inspect the devices before they go out and then put tamper evidence seals and then put in place those physical checks to That'd ensure nice. that, right? <laughs> that those are the things that, that should be done. Now, I, I believe overall, uh, was our election in 2016, you know, hacked? Uh, no, we were socially engineered. You know, all the data came out, there was campaigns, you know, regardless, I, I mean, I don't believe in my mind that that we really had you know, too much different than what we do to other countries. It just so happened it was finally used against us where uh, foreign countries influenced our election. Hey, surprise, you know, we, we do it to every, we do it to all these other countries. You know, what, what did we think at some point when the capabilities existed that they wouldn't try it on us? And we got socially engineered. Yeah. Um, as a country, a lot of people were tricked. This is where the whole, you know, aspect of fake news really has has you know proliferated over the last four years. And uh, Facebook, with you know all of the the data that was manipulated, um, you know, with uh, you know that became available. So yeah, we got we got tricked. We got tricked into giving up more information that we should, and you know uh, that probably shouldn't have happened. Do you think there was a, pro, a proliferation of, I don't know if it was fake news or not, but it seemed like things changed on Facebook, which has over, what, 2 billion users per day? It's, but it did seem around 2016 that the discourse began to change. There were more extravagant, posts that I was used to seeing. Was that my imagination or was that really happening? Uh, absolutely happening. And, and I think it, and it's done on purpose. So, you know, since, and this is, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand this aspect. In 2008, when President Obama was elected, you know, Facebook was still as in its, in its infancy, right? I don't even know if, I don't even know if Twitter existed yet in 2008. I don't recall. Um, so then as these social media sites start becoming more prevalent, mobile, you know, smartphone adoption rate starts to skyrocket because the iPhone came out in, I think, 2007. So, <clears throat> so now all of a sudden, the connected use of being connected all the time with social media, those things started to happen. And then we started seeing studies about what types of transactions on the internet are most likely to get a response. And it is right. unanimous, basically, that a negative post will get more responses than a positive. And so if I say something that is inflammatory, whether it be far left, far right, I am likely to get more retweets, yeah. more likes, and more responses. Clickbait. Yes. And yeah. in 2016 is when we are, we're up on that hockey stick curve. I would like to believe that we're at the end of it, but... I don't think we are. I think we're seeing that that trend is still going up. And 2016, really, we, we got to see that. Now, how does 2020 compare to that, in, in your opinion? Now, now it's amplified. Now, every news media site news that is, 
every organization knows, all right, if I need to get people in an uproar, I am only going to put forth things that are inflammatory to one side or the other. So now we have extremes. Because so I ex remember, yeah, I remember when I was a journalist, I remember I had an editor come up and tell me, and she was very serious. She wasn't someone who joked around. Her personality was like that. And I remember she said to me when I was starting out, she said, I either want to see a puppy dog or water skiing squirrel, or I want to see a car, you know, driven into a tree or somebody's brains bashed in on the front page of every newspaper. It's either going to be a Bleeds and Leads or the water skiing squirrel or something like that. One extreme or the other. And I remember at the time thinking that's, not necessarily a reflection of reality, you know, and how fair is that? I don't know. But at the time, I don't remember how old I was, but it was a long time ago. And I was just like, okay, sure. I'll go along with that. Now I wouldn't go along with that. I'd probably walk out or something, or maybe I'd be like, I need to talk to you in the room or something. So we're, is it fair to say we're, we're being played? Absolutely. I believe we are. And it's both sides. You know, I mean, I, and, and just, you know, I know it's not a little, you know, politics, um, but I've been very vocal about um, who I voted for, which was not President Trump nor, you know, Secretary Clinton um, in 2016. And it's on, on my well, on, on my own podcast. Uh, and, and, I, and I'm likely not to vote for either of them this year. And people might say, oh, it's your, you're throwing your vote away. You know, I pay more attention to who I'm voting for locally. I, did, I pay more attention to who's going to Congress on my behalf than, than whoever the president is. Because having spent so many years in Washington, the only thing that changes is the president. You know, people in Congress don't change. Um, they're there, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, but we're being played. We're being played by both sides. So when I was being trained in, you know, intelligence analysis, intel, um you know, what I found is, is and, and this was, you know, even more years ago, but you have to take multiple news sources and then figure out what none of them are saying. And that's where the real story is. Right. You have to read between <laughs> the lines. Okay. Yeah. yeah. One it's becoming things, more and more challenging. Yeah. There's actually a course on the great courses plus um, for anybody out there who likes as a Roku and wants to, to get a course. Uh, the Great Course is Plus, and there's one called Misinformation mm -hmm. in the Digital Age, I think it's called. Yeah, that's and awesome. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yes, I, I am. But uh, I watched it, and I'm probably going to watch it again and take notes on it because it was very good about checking, you know, is this a real image? Is this a real video? Because the technology is accelerating faster than our ability to discern whether or not these are real videos or not. So it's really incumbent upon people to really think for themselves, does this fit in with like an internal logic or not? Absolutely. My, my colleagues, uh, um, Dr. Emily Duraj and Dr. Shar Samples, I believe is the other co-author, they recently presented and came up with an algorithm that would give you probabilities of a particular news source, if it's fake news or not. Mm -hmm. And their probability was quite high. I believe they presented it in uh europe last summer um Who was i'll have one? to check uh what's that who was number one? Oh, oh they didn't do uh, they didn't give me a a source it was just like you could put in the particular article and then based oh, on the okay. the the searches they had a probability matrix as to whether or not the article was fake or not yeah i'm sure it would it would crunch the sentence structure the vocabulary yep. the tone let me ask you a broad question from the perspective of a small business owner because that's really my audience it's who my heart goes out to the most especially now when we talk about online security and then computer security is there one area over another that's more vulnerable uh, or more often the doorway to breaches is one more vulnerable or are they equal if you're a small uh, business owner yeah, so you know, I actually believe this is um, this particular attack is still very fruitful for the adversary, and it works equally well on the small business owner as well as large businesses. And and it's difficult. Um, 
which is trying to get, it's called phishing. So the phishing is when something comes in through email to get you to click on a link. And I can't yeah. tell you exactly how successful these things are. So um, last week, a security company that actually teaches this stuff that it's called SANS and their training is remarkable, I gotta look but they up. were, they were also fished someone. And, and I don't know exactly who, but it was something like 24,000 of their client records were compromised because someone clicked on a link and it gave an adversary um, access to stuff. And it was probably someone in administration. So and, yeah. and they're still relatively a small company, but their training is phenomenal. I send my people to their training all the time. You know, it, it only takes one wrong move. And so if I'm a small business owner, the number one thing you could do with your email communication is any email that's coming into your organization from outside and all of them do this, whether it be, you know, if you're on Microsoft Office 365 or if you're on G Suite, append your email and the body of the message if it comes outside of your organization and it just says external change your color of that like you know every 90 days just change the color because then people are less likely to click on that you know it's external um you know and it, it's it's difficult for us to get you know as a security person and you and i know you're you're a, a primarily in marketing david and so if i were to say to you as someone in marketing you can't have html email you're going to be going no i've got to have this because it's because I lose my brand. I would lose my brand if I don't have that. I'd um, have to I'd have to change it around, but it would it would take it would change things. It yeah. would. Would it and, be and simpler? I, yeah, probably would be uh, better for security. But I don't know if that I don't know if uh, that's a great thing because then you lose your brand. Email is still a primary communication point for all of us. So you know, I I wouldn't necessarily want to do that. I I think. You know, the small business center by doing that's a big thing um and you know they're, you're going to get breached right so have cyber insurance um have those discussions as part of your business because you're going to get breached it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when i think for small business owners i believe right now the annual rate of occurrence for a breach in a small business is is one in every six years so um you should you should pre plan for that just like you would a fire yeah, and if it's that common, does it do any good to say, and I don't know if this is really that accurate, you tell me, if you say, hey, look, if you don't know who the email is from, delete it. If you do want to open the email, don't click on any links until you look at the top portion to see uh, whatever that's called, where you view the details to see who's sending this, does the URL the website address match up with who it's, you think it's being sent from. Because I get emails all the time that are supposedly from this host or that host or this company or PayPal. And I forward it back to them all the time. And I say, the URL doesn't match. So I know it's not from PayPal or from whatever hosting provider. Is that is that, that useful or is there something that, more absolutely. effective? Well, I mean, there are definitely things that are more effective, but it costs a lot of money and, and small business owners may not be able to afford such things. So that's absolutely what you, sh you should do. Um, the link, because everyone puts that hyperlink, says click here. Well, if you are on your computer, just roll your mouse over to it and then the mouse will tell you what the full URL is. Right. Um, if you're on your um, smartphone, a long press. So you push in and let it hold for a second and it'll pop with what the URL is. Um, so those are definitely some things you can do. I also, when I get an email, cause I, I get them all the time. Hey, you know, your American express, something has happened with your account. Click here. I never do that. I go to my American express, you know, website directly and log in. Do I have a secure message? If not, no, I don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, this is difficult part, David, you know, you know, I've got 20 plus years of trying to think like a, you know, a bad person. I'm still not a bad person, but I've got, you know, 20 some years at thinking that way. Uh, and it's hard. Most people are good people. So for them to think that everyone's out to get them, that's, that's not common. So, you know, you, you have to rely on some, some folks like myself to kind of, you know, talk about it in terms of, well, you're in business. So think about it as just another avenue of fraud. 
people are always trying to cause fraudulent actions. Uh, so be you know, a link, assume it's bad. It yeah. may not be, but just assume it. And, um, you know, it, it's going to be challenging because uh, <laughs> if you if you have a company and you use email and i mean you're going to be using it a lot depending on how many employees and departments you have are you better off you know using something like uh, proton mail there's another one i can't remember their name but their website is red uh it's some so i can't remember what it is but there's some other company that is similar to proton mail where you can send an email and it's encrypted both ways it has um, you can set it to expire within 24 hours do those things really work well you know in certain use cases sure um, with the average person yeah for the average person yeah for a company you know, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to do something like that because, you know, there's there's business, there's other business requirements where you have to keep certain records for a period of time. And, you know, so you don't necessarily want those things. Um, and then you lose, like if you're using Proton Mail, and, and I don't and I, I don't know the answers, I'd have to look, but I don't know that Proton Mail allows you to do corporate hosting. And even if they did do corporate hosting for you, uh, would you get the types of things you needed in order to perform a business properly? Right. So, and I, you know, so there's always Probably that balance. Practical. Yeah, there's always that balance of usability and security. And really, we're we're trying to figure out the right recipe. And that recipe, you know, think about it like, you know, I don't know if you're a whiskey drinker, but think about it if you if you happen to like an old fashioned. You know, mm -hmm. so every place you go for an old fashioned, it's a little bit different because some bartenders like it with rye, some like it with bourbon. So how much alcohol to the sweet? So think about this, the alcohol being the security, the sweet being the business. What's that right ratio to have optimal performance? Um, too much security and no one's going to use it. Right. Too less security, you're going out of business because you're constantly compromised. Now kind of on a related note, but still a broad question. What deficits do you see in most small businesses and startups and nonprofits in terms of their internet? And then on the flip side, their computer use. Are problems a result of one issue in most cases that you can pinpoint? Yes, so, uh, and this comes back down to uh, skill set. So I think a lot of small business owners uh, they should invest in the community that they're in. Um, and by that, the, one of the easiest things they can do for relatively cheap labor um, and is useful is go to the local universities. They've, there are some really talented young adults that are there. Yeah. And the, in, in almost every state right now, you have an NSA, National Security Agency, um, Center of Academic Excellence certified and uh, cybersecurity university. There's like over 200 universities now. So they have a program. So if they have that, you're going to find some kids. You know, pay them 15 bucks an hour um, and let them let them do this in the part-time aspect for you. One, they're going to experience. They're going to be trained on the latest technologies. Yeah. It might take them longer to do some of it, but you're going to get some good work. You're helping the community. You're helping the next generation get some some benefits. And, you know, there, you might find someone that valuable enough that you want to keep full time. Um, next, you know, I really, really love G Suite. I think there's a lot of things as a small business owner um, that you can get out of it. One, as a small business owner, look to web based applications that have a reputable company, Google and Google partners, because at least Google vets them. Um, I, I happen to be a big fan. Chromebooks. Um, are cheap they're easy to use and they're pretty darn secure because right. of right now a chromebook when you know back in the day people used to say um macs were more secure it wasn't they were more secure it's just that they didn't have a market share no bad actor was trying to hack it because it wasn't worth it to them so you also get that from a chromebook perspective right now would uh is it still valid that a linux or linux i don't know how, how you pronounce it would a linux be equal to a Chromebook in terms of security? So, uh, yeah, I mean, basically Chromebook is Linux at its core. 
you know, uh, it does, it has that, you know, but it's going to be more difficult for a small business owner to maybe have that skill set to run Linux. It's just, you can do more things mm, with okay. Linux. But if I'm a, if I'm a small business owner, I only want to be using web-based applications that are hosted by, I'm going to transfer that risk. So bringing it back to the business server, I'm going to transfer the security of that engagement to that organization. So I'm going to run my e-commerce platform and a Google certified partner. That's a web-based application that is PCI DSS certified. So that's the payment card industry, digital security standards. Um, they're certified in order to do that. So I've transferred that risk. They're a Google certified partner. They're running my e-commerce platform. So now all I have to know is very minimal and I'm transferring risk and it's cheaper um, from an OpEx perspective than it would be for me to try to run it myself, especially when I don't have the, I don't have the personnel that may know how to do all of those things. Um, you know, Square is a great example of transferring that risk to Square, which I can use through my mobile phone that can mm -hmm. plug into your e-commerce platform. Okay. Now, if a service provider, NPO, business owner, I've heard this a lot where they say, you know, look, I don't have anything of value to a hacker. <laughs> they can hack my laptop. They can hack my website. I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. yeah, don't do it to me. I love hackers, <laughs> but you hear this a lot and I'm sure you've heard it. How do you counteract that? How do you reason that away? Oh, it's uh, so to me, it comes down to, this is, this is where we are. You know, we don't we don't think this way in the United States. So I always put it to the, uh, to them like this. I'm like, well, do you have a hundred dollars in your bank account? Do you have two hundred dollars? And they're like, well, yeah. Well, to someone living in Ukraine, you can live for a month on two hundred dollars. That's true. So if you've got two hundred dollars in your bank account or fifty dollars, I just gotta I just gotta find four people for fifty dollars, and I ate for a month for a family in Ukraine. In yeah. other parts of the world, it's even cheaper. And where do we see a lot of these hacks coming from? Other countries. Yeah, it's a lot of dried beans and rice. Right. And then I also say, because they also believe, well, I, what, what do I have? I have, you know, I don't have anything. But what you don't know where you're going to be in 10 years from now. And this is why the actual um, cost per record breached in academia is higher than any other place. Because these hackers out there, the bad hackers, they are creating a pipeline of future potential people that need to compromise later. So they compromise academia to get those records. They got all your PII. They wait till you make something of yourself. And as you do it, boom, now they've got you and you didn't even know it. It's the long con. So to speak. that's pretty slick. Actually, I never thought of it like that. Yeah. That's actually a really good idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, I said, that's, that's why I never thought of it. I'm just not thinking in those terms. Are there tools online that you could recommend to check the security of email accounts, websites, your e-commerce site, and so on? Because um, you see them online. I think what is one Virus Total? I think I've heard of. Yeah, so Virus Total is a is a great little um, um, website, and what Virus Total is really used for is to determine whether or not when someone sends me an attachment or I'm downloading something from the internet, how do I know if this has got malware in it? So I can upload it to Virus Total, and it'll scan it with like 50 different antivirus engines that are out there. Um, so it's a, I, I use that all the time. Um, okay, you do. Yeah, I, okay, I love it. Okay, wow. Okay, I guess um, it's legit. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a great product. I actually I believe Google purchased it not too long ago. Um, and then another thing that I like is is uh, it's a website called you know Am I Pwned? Um, P W N E D. Oh, yes. And, right. Am, what, am I Pwned? I think is another. Yep. One. Right. And so by, by putting your email addresses in there and you can pay for a service and they'll constantly send you alerts and things like that. You can send up a bunch. But what it tells you is if your if your email address has, has been shown up in any other compromised um, yes. disclosure and yeah. you want to know, like especially if it's your corporate ones, you know, has they mm -hmm. been showing up? So put in all your uh, corporate yeah. email addresses. I actually did do that. I actually did find an email address that was compromised. I went in right away, changed the password to something that's like, 500 characters or something immediately. <laughs> um, and let me ask you, I'm thinking that for most business websites, they're attacked by automated bots, automated programs. Is that true? Yeah, 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, websites today, at least trying to compromise a website, is more about glory, or they just want to do a denial of service just to get you down. Um, because websites now mm. are, are, are generally hosted by a third party for most companies nowadays. It no longer is that web server sitting in your data center and, and it's connected to all these things. So it's not as it's not as much as what it used to be. Now it's about fame. So um, this is why hosting your website in, in Google or Amazon or Azure is so beneficial because you can make it to where it's almost denial of service proof. Because if, if Amazon or Apple or rather Amazon, Microsoft or Google get taken down, it's a, big, a bigger problem. So we don't see those as much. Now it, we, we've, we continue to see that those phishing attacks are still really the most prevalent. Um, if you happen to have servers that are on the internet, you know, patch them, make sure they're patched, make sure they're working because in fact, the Equifax breach that occurred, you know, about two years ago, uh, the, the, it just didn't get patched. So what, you know, patches that, yeah. that update, most people, they see an update come in and they're like, oh no, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow. Well, please don't wait till tomorrow for too long, you know, tell it to like do it at two o'clock in the morning. If you've got servers on the internet, you know, make sure you've got good countermeasures and patch them, do usability testing and get them patched as soon as you can. Now, let me ask you this. This is kind of like a two or three part question. And I'm not sure what your take is on this. Is I like the idea that you can have your privacy and it's, and again, people say, well, I have nothing to hide or whatever. It's not so much that as you want to be able to watch a TV show in the UK that you can't see in the US. You want to be able to read whatever you want to read without worrying that uh, Verizon or whatever might take it down or whatever. Is, or just the morality of it, the ethics of it. Is it unrealistic to expect online privacy in 2020? And then I've well, got part two and part uh, three. Yeah, well, uh, so it comes back down as to what you what we believe is is reasonable. Um, and, and and I am someone that accepts the risk on some things because I want the usability of it. I, I believe the benefits outweigh some of the concern. As an example, uh, I have Google Home. I like the automation of it. I like what I'm able to do with it. Um, and I, I benefit from it. Now, I do some things to kind of, you know, eliminate some of the things. Like, it's not connected to a Dan Ford account. It's connected to a burner account of mine that I keep some things. So, it would be very challenging for for someone to kind of tie it back to my identity. But I, I and yet there's still things that leak from it. And so, and the average uh, person isn't going to know how to do that. Right. Or want so, to, for that matter. Right. And I would still say that I would, even if I didn't know all those things, I'd probably still do it because of the benefit. Now, there's other things that are out there that I believe are just unfair business practices, such as uh, cable companies, not like I'm from Maryland. So why should I not be able to see the Maryland news when I want to see it? Why should I not be able to watch the you know the Washington Redskins um, football game because I grew up right next to DC um, and why should I not be able to watch that game just because I now live in another state yeah um, you know I so I should be able to do that um, but they don't like that so they want to keep things local um, and and really I I don't want to be targeted with ads uh, so why should why should verizon or comcast xfinity or cox you know you name the cable provider out there uh why should they know everywhere i'm going on the internet why should they be able to track that um and then bombard me with advertisements i i don't want that stuff right and then you have the i forget i think it's called geo blocking yeah yeah so is it unrealistic to expect uh to 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 have that privacy in the u.s in 2020 that i want to be able to watch a game like you said i want to be able to read whatever i want to read without worrying does verizon approve 
or you know I know there's all kinds of legislation going on where certain things can be blocked in certain countries uh, for example I love the show Dragon's Den which is where Shark Tank is taken from in the in the United Kingdom I like their version better I can't watch it in the US even if I want to pay I can't go to Amazon or whatever and subscribe or purchase, you know, a season of the show. I can't watch it in the U.S. So what do you do? And is it wrong to expect that? I don't know how to really phrase this, but you know what I'm trying to get at here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the regular person will be very challenged to have that type of freedom. Uh, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, but that's the way, this is where I think it really comes back down to um, business models uh, and you got to vote with your, where you want to pay for services. For those providers that are going to limit where I, what I can do, um, I may not want to, to use them. And it's hard because now these other companies are getting smart. They're blocking VPNs, which is how people would get a virtual private network. So and that was it, part two of my question. Yep. You know, they're, they're blo these companies are starting to block that. So then, then what do you do? Well, you know, I ha I know how I would do it. I would set up a, you know, remote server. Uh, I'd pay for a location in uh, that part of the world um, where it might cost me, you know, a couple of bucks extra a month, but I would, com you know, connect into that. And it's now it's called a proxy server. Um, so now it's there and they don't know that I'm, essentially watching it through that but that's difficult for a regular person to set up it's difficult it's time consuming and it may or may not even be practical if you just want to see a tv show right or see what's going on in another country you would think well wait a minute i'm an american i'm in the u.s why is it wrong if i want to watch a tv show in another country and you're happy to pay for it but that's not even available to you so how do you navigate around that or through that? Are VPNs practical? Or to what extent would you want to consider something like Tor? So Tor and uh, a VPN, I mean, they're, they're for the practicality of what some, like, you know, we're watching your, you know, the Dragon's Den in the UK. If they're blocking um, VPNs, they're probably also blocking Tor nodes. And so this is a matter of time to where they find those, so, um, Tor, which is the onion router. So for people that believe, you know, what they hear about the dark web, things like that, that's an entry point into a dark web site um, or, or infrastructure rather, not a site. And so what happens is when you connect into Tor, um, you can say you want to exit in this country uh, if you so want, or you can make it random. So I might exit in the UK. Now what happens is it still comes out with an IP address. So uh, it comes out with a unique identifier still in some way, shape, or form. A lot of companies are constantly looking for all of those, um, what they call exit nodes, those identifiers. They add them into their firewall and they put them in a blacklist. Right. So it's only a matter of time. And so back in the day you know, with DirecTV, you would hear about people stealing DirecTV. And so what would happen is they would figure out a way to compromise DirecTV and they would get about 30 days of free direct tv and then you know direct tv had figured out they changed all the codes and then you've got to wait another two weeks so you know you would basically get four weeks of free direct tv and two weeks of not well think about that with tour eventually they're going to block it vpns are similar except you're typically paying for that service and right. i don't think um, I, I don't think companies should be blocking them because I'm paying for a legit service. There's actually a way of identifying that it's Daniel Ford or David Summerfleck is paying for that IP address for that period of time. And they know, and they could actually monetize from that. Why shouldn't they monetize? They, they can. Um, they're choosing not to for whatever reason. And that's the part where I, I would take a little bit of uh, issue with. They're both practical um, to use are both easier to use but they're i think they're limited uh timing so you know eventually they're going to block it at some point in time and then you guys restart they got to find a new way of getting there just with a different service or something along those lines yeah yeah and i know everybody and their brothers coming out with a vpn i think um 
Firefox, I think, is coming out with one, or they already may have it out. Yeah, they might. I don't know. Um, yeah, and it would be really great if we could read news from other countries or watch TV in other countries. I, I just I don't get it. Um, if you want to browse the internet securely, which uh, which one do you think is better? Is one better than the other? Which browser? Or or or, or, for, or... or VPN or Tor? Yeah. Um, or is it apples and oranges? So well, no, it all you know it comes back down to what you're most worried about. Um, for me, I don't. I'm not as worried about big brotherish type things. I'm worried about cookie tracking. Um, and while there's a lot of legitimate use cases for cookie tracking, what you don't know is how long those cookies are there for. And like Facebook is notorious for this. You know, you got Facebook open and they're reading everything, every single tab you've got, they're collecting data from it. Yeah. And that becomes dangerous. Um, you know, and, and because they're selling your data. I mean, remember, you're the product, uh, and you know that's a that's a challenge. So, I, I I invest in things like there's a company called Ghostery. Um, I like Ghostery. Uh, they they do a really good job in blocking you know cookies. Um, if you're on there's a, there's Privacy Badger, which is a product from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, or at least it used to be. I don't know if it's still there. Um, you can use that, and these plug in to various different browsers, Chrome, um, Firefox, uh, Safari. I don't, I would never use a Microsoft browser. I hate it um, just because they're always just slow, bad, clunky. Um, I don't know how Edge is based on Chromium now, so who knows, but forget Internet Explorer. I, I, I like Brave? Chrome. What's that? Brave? Brave? Um, you know, funny enough, I know some of the, the developers there. Uh, it's not, it's not a bad product. I mean, they're supposed to build some privacy in there. You may have some usability issues depending on some uh, web servers, how it displays data because it's yeah. still relatively new. Yeah, it seems like something that really hasn't gained traction yet. Um, but let me just, um, I'm going over my time limit because there's just so much I want to ask you about. There's so many things. When we talk in terms of what's going on now with COVID-19, we talk about the economy that looks like, I don't know if it can get worse. I'm sure it can. Um, what would you say to the business owner who's struggling to get by right now? What should their their top, you know, two or three concerns be in, in relation to internet security, computer security, your areas of expertise? So big thing is going to be the amount of, and which I'm already seeing quite a bit, COVID-19 scams and phishing attempts. Yeah, right? get, get your N95 mask here. Yes, you know, get, keep those, um, you know, your, you know, those links are gonna be bad. Like they're, go, they're trying to get you. You, you have, everyone's got to assume that when they get an email interaction, it's assume it's bad until proven innocent because they're, they're, that's what they're using and they're using it a lot. They're using it with news article links, everything they can. Um, I mean, I recently did a phishing test for my organization. Um, that was a survey that made it look like it came from human resources um, on COVID-19. and and yes, you know, I I got I'm gonna get people to click. The problem with phishing tests, just so everyone understands, um, I I don't like it when people shame those that click on a link, because the phishing tests look like legitimate emails, yeah. and our legitimate emails look like phishing att attacks. Um, so the idea is, you know, I I'm happy because my I get a lot of people reporting a potential suspicious email. So great, kudos to them. Um, so if you have small business owners, be like, if you see something that looks bad, well, utilize alternative communications um, for your company. This is why either your Office 365 or G Suite, use the chat functions instead of email for official corporate communication. Just say, look, we're not sending official corporate communication through email. It's going to come through Microsoft Teams or it's gonna come through Google Chat. 
Um, it's going to come through SharePoint through your intranet, or I don't remember what G Suite's you know one is that may uh, what they what they call theirs uh, off the top of my head. But that's where you post your official corporate communication. Stop doing it in email. If you can stop, the sooner you can stop email and retrain yourselves for that, perfect. Um, you know, you don't, you know, it's not difficult to make a mobile app nowadays, and you can mm. utilize, you know, look, you know, utilize your marketing to teams. Like if you have even a little bit of marketing, those CMS um, functionalities that you do with your website, you can do with an intranet, and you can put it into a mobile app, so it's a push notification that you got something good, yeah. right? So take from the best of all of the areas of business and you can use that same way in which you communicate with your customers, communicate with your employees. And then if you start doing that, guess what's going to happen? Your employees are going to communicate better, which therefore is going to result in you having better communication with your customers. I've, I've, I've taken more notes on this interview than I have in, in some <laughs> other ones recently. And I've got a list of about 20 other questions that I want to ask you <laughs> from what you think about fake news, psyops, passwords, encryptions, texting, Zoom bombing. I've got so many things I want to ask you about. I have to tie it up for now, but I, I very much appreciated uh, talking with you. How can uh, listeners and viewers get in touch with you if they have questions um, or some concerns? So uh, the best way would be uh, you know, either Twitter. So uh, I should have probably put the Twitter handle in there, but it's at, you know, Nostra Danielus. So like Nostradamus, you know, uh, is one way, um, you know, you, you can easily find me there, you know, on LinkedIn, Daniel Ford, if they, if they want, you can email me at drford at uh, echelonorchid.io, which is also by, you know, my, where my YouTube show is. And, and David, I hope you'll come on and we can, we can flip the script and I can ask you about how, how to market and how to, how I'd to love to, businesses. You know, I'd be, love to, I, I could tell you war stories and, and, and ask me anything that you could ever think of. I love it. Um, I really appreciate it. I will put the links. I'll also get these links as well from LinkedIn. And I've looked at your website as well. I think I looked you up on Twitter and so on. So I'll add these links to the video as well. So for those viewing it, you will probably see some really annoying banner links <laughs> running through the video. And for those listening, I'll put it into the footer notes as well. So Daniel, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Please stick around for another minute or two as I uh, tie everything up. And for those watching or listening, thank you for tuning into another episode of Rebooting Business. It's tough out there, uh, so please be safe, everybody. And thank you again for viewing. And I'd be remiss if I did say if you've enjoyed this video or this podcast, please give it a positive review or subscribe. Every little bit helps. And thank you and take care, everybody. You've been listening to Rebooting Business, the podcast for, about, and by America's small business owners who are ready to reboot and rebuild businesses in a post-COVID-19 world. To learn more about rebooting your business or be a guest on the podcast, please visit www.dms.blue today.